Hello everybody and welcome to a very unusual hobby cheating video. Uh, today we're going to talk about display boards. So I'm working on my newest display board and I thought at the very early stage here I would share a moment to talk about kind of how you, the, the basic tools and stuff like that. So I'm going to talk about how I'm going to build this out. This is for my Slanesh army and sort of how to think about display boards. Now, before we get into it, let me just say thank you very much for watching this. I appreciate it. Now, if you want to know more about how to build better terrain and everything like that, you should go over and see Mel the Terrain Tutor. If for some reason you're watching this and you haven't yet subscribed to Mel the Terrain Tutor, what are you doing with your life? The man is a master. And a lot of things that I use here, I learned sort of from him. All right. So, at any rate, what are our basic tools here? So we're starting with some 2x2 two two MDF pink foam. It's like insulation. Uh, and you can, uh, this is just the general size of display boards that most tournaments allow is 2x2. Two two, hence why I'm using this. Uh, so you can go buy this at like Home Depot or Lowe's or you know whatever hardware store you have near you. Um, it can obviously be cut to size, it can be broken up. So like, here's just a, a broken up piece I have from something else, okay? You can stack it on top of each other. We'll talk about what we do with the edges and seam lines as we move on through the project. But ideally what you wanna do is figure out your height. So this first part is just all about planning. The simplest display board is, you know, you kinda of take a piece of this or whatever, you put some texture on it, maybe a couple plants, maybe a little terrain piece, and you call it a day. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Like, if you wanna go that direction, then the answer is you get something like this, you go get a bunch of like Vallejo basing paste, or you make yourself a big slurry of mud and rocks from your yard, along with PVA glue, and maybe a little bit of, of paste and water, and you just slurry it over the top, put down some foliage, dry brush paint, call it a day, okay? Nothing wrong with that. If you want to go more crazy, this is for you. So, when you want to go more crazy, the first step is you've got to think about your height, how high do you need to go, and what is it going to be decorated with. So in this case, what I want to represent is the intersection at a town that has fallen to Slanesh, right? And so, and I, you, one of the keys here is I've got to have enough room to still put my army on the board. So I can't build a town with sort of the normal, uh, density of buildings that I might want. So I've still got to, I've got to kind of walk a line here. Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing I did was establish my actual intersection. So I used a pen and a ruler and etched in some lines for the road. And that's the first thing I'll say is there's no reason you can't just draw into this layer to sort of mark everything out, measure it out. The second thing you want to do is make sure that if you're going to place buildings that you sort of sit them on the base board and figure out exactly where they go, what needs to be where, and so on and so forth, right? Um, that everything's going to basically fit. Uh, because you don't want to get to a later stage where you've built up the board, you've added a bunch of stuff to it, and then all of a sudden you try to put your building into it and it doesn't actually fit, right? So. We measure everything out. If there's gonna be other spaces I marked, so if you can see this cut out here, this is where there's gonna be a river running through the town, like a, um, uh, a canal, right? Uh, because that feels very urban and water pours look cool and stuff like that. So we'll just cap the edges here eventually and then do a pour near the end. Um, so we marked down all the buildings. This I want to be back here. This is somebody's important house, right? Like, so this is like the nice house. So we elevated it up. So I cut a couple rough pieces into the shape of a hill. You don't need to worry about getting them matched exactly. Now I'm cutting all mine with just my crappy X-Acto blade. No, I'm going to drop something there. With just my crappy X-Acto blade and, uh, and then breaking it apart. The better way to do it, but a tool I don't have because I don't make enough of these, I make one display board a year, is a hot wire cutter. Again, something you can order online. It slices right through uh, this MDF foam. 
The final thing I'll say is if you're going to build something particularly heavy and thick, okay, like if you're going to build a display board that has a lot of weight to it, then I would also recommend putting something underneath it. You can at the also at the hardware store you can get a two by two piece of wood like MDF wood, and it'll fit exactly to this foam, and then you can basically lock that right under there, glue the foam down onto it, and now you have a really solid, basically plywood base for the display board. Not essential, but helpful, because then at the end you can do stuff like put handles on the side or something if you want. The other thing that's gonna be part of the board is this girl right here. She's being covered up there. There you go. This big gold statue, uh, obviously an offering to Slanesh that all the people built out of all the gold in the town, like nothing, there's no gold in the town or anything because they melted it all down and did this. Obviously it is printed in this sort of, this is all 3D printed, so it's rough and we'll have to sand that down and stuff like that. But that'll be a project for the end, but that'll be all gold. And it's gonna be people dragging it through the center of the town, basically. Probably right about back here is where it makes the most sense, which is unfortunately behind this thing for you to see it. but. Whereas this is gonna be a little graveyard, this is a normal house, this is some kind of auditorium or park, and this is the rich person's house. That's how I thought about it, right? So kinda of understand what your, and then these are roads, good to go. Understand what your display board's gonna look like, what the basic elements of it are. Once you have it all plotted out, you know what surface is gonna go where, then is when you can sort of glue all this together. Now, I would, I'll tell you right now, I would not attach the buildings. If you're going to use separate buildings, don't attach them. If you're going to just for purposes of transport, because then you can take the building off and you can, you know, bring it along separately, set up the display board, set up the buildings. Just makes it easier to fit in your car or anything like that. But everything that is permanently part of this, hills, rocks, terrain, maybe even like small bridges, stuff like that, that you want all glued down, all solid, one piece, one component, right? Now, uh, the other thing we'll do when we glue it together is we have little sticks that we're gonna actually stick through here, which I'll show you what that looks like when we come back in a minute, to make sure that everything has additional support. So I'm not just gonna rely on glue to hold this together. We're gonna use basically shish kebab sticks, run them through here, glue them, and then glue the actual pieces down. And then once we have all that there and everything's, we leave it to dry and stuff like that, once all that's good to go, then we can actually start working on building up ground texture, stuff like that. So at the moment, I'm gonna keep working, positioning. There's a couple more things I wanna work out, exactly see how they fit. And when I come back, then I'll talk about attaching this all together. All right, so we got everything plotted out. And now we've got a big thing of Elmer's glue. All of these are glued. And basically to glue them down, all we do is take a piece. I'm not too worried about like edges or those things being rough or stuff like that at this point, because it's all gonna get covered up with basically other materials. And basically we test our position, make sure we've got it right as to how we want it on there. Okay, should be good like how that is. So, let me pull that up. You can see I've used some paint on the back of this one before. Okay, so we got a nice thing of glue on the back of there. Now, note, it's real squishy because it's just PVA glue. It's just Elmer's glue, so it slides around and it's squishy. That's why we then have our little shish kebab punji stick things. And what we're gonna do with those is then find some spots on the board and basically just drive them through all the way down. If you wanna get a little lead hole going first, you can keep one with a sharp point Stab through, basically make sure you go all the way through the thing. And there you go. Pull back out. Then 
we put a little bit of glue down in that hole there. We'll run that down in there. And then we just give it a nice little, want to wipe the rest of that glue. I set my paper towel down when I walked over. Wipe the rest of that off. Come in, give it a nice snip. Cut it down to size. There you go. And what that does when I put four of these little sticks in is keep everything even where I want it. So because this will go sliding around, this wants to pop up, it wants to move around. The next, the other thing you gotta do is you gotta find something nice and heavy, okay? So whatever you happen to have that's nice and heavy. So here, for example, I have the bin of the rest of my terrain. So it's a good idea when you let this dry overnight, you wanna put something heavy on it like that. That way it's forced to be really, really tight because this stuff doesn't wanna to stick together and the glue has a lot of mass and it's gonna push it apart. So when I actually let this dry, we put heavy things and everything, go get some big heavy books, whatever you got. Like this thing weighs a ton because it's all full of terrain that's old and stuff. And then let it sit there and you're good to go. So I'm gonna keep putting my sticks through to make sure everything's there. I'm gonna put something heavy on top and then we wait overnight for everything to dry. So back in what for you will be a second, but for me will be a much longer time. All right, we're back. You can see we've got a lot of changes. So what have we done? Well, first off, we laid down all of our basing paste that we wanna use as our base texture and I kinda separated everything out here to really, ex you know, so I can make things clear what's going on. So this is going to be a cemetery area, so I set up the walls to make sure I had everything marked properly there. These are not glued down or anything uh, because we won't want to. We're going to pin them in the bottom and then run a pin down in here so when we show up we can just lock them in at the at an event. Over here we marked out our space where the building is going to go and walked our uh, our cobblestone drive up to it. So that's the base of our building. Back here, where this one's going to be, we have that right there. So basically we're good to go on that one. And then up here, this is our big hill where we're going to have where we have our little path that leads up to it. And then right there. So the key was you can see where we took the original stack of that pink foam. We used some uh, dap, some patch, oops, sorry. There you go, some patch and paint. Uh, this is like wall putty. We puttied around it to build out the hill. And then over top of it, we used stuff like this, which is the Vallejo basing paste. Uh, this one is the earth texture. This is the brown one. So that's all of this back here as well as up here. I used a couple different textures in different places. Then here in the center, where we have the cobblestone road, we laid out some Milliput. Uh, this is the Milliput White, which is this one right here, which I really like for this purpose. Uh, and we then used a roller to roll all that out. Also, it's not going to be incredibly visible, but here in the in our channels, see if I can lift this up, these are gonna fall, but we'll do what we can. Uh, you can see that there's like some rocks down in here. In fact, let me just pop these walls off. That way I can lift the whole thing up without making a giant mess. Okay. So, here you can see how we made the texture for our riverbed. So we used like four different sizes of rocks. We used some big rocks and then little sand and grit in between. And then we mudded the sides of the walls to get that going. And then on top of that here, I wanted something on the edge of my road, like the bigger stones that would edge the curb. So here we use these big paver bricks and we laid them out one by one and glued them down so that here they're forming a nice edge. Okay. So again, it's just about slowly constructing up that reality. But this basing paste is nice, but it's not everything we want to do. 
the reality is we still need to add a little more texture. So for that, we have the following. So first off, I have some black battleground, which is just a really nice medium size grit. Uh, you can kind of see the size of that, right? So that's our medium grit. Here we have some bigger rocks. I do not remember for the life of me where this one's from originally, I'm sorry. Um, but you can see this is like my large grit rock, right? And then we have our sand. And this is my old Citadel sand. I actually really liked this. Uh, you know, it's $8 for a bunch of sand. You could go get it from the, the beach if you have a beach near you. But uh, as I live up in the middle of the country and there's no really beaches around, this is a good enough deal. You get a ton of sand for it. And it's actually a really nice ultra fine sand like it's really super fine like hyper ground beach sand so i really like it for this purpose so we've got our three different textures here and right here what i've done is i've mixed up a slurry of uh, just pva glue and water okay now in this case i don't add any paint or anything like that uh, because I'm not concerned about it showing through the realities. There's lots of different colors here, and all this is going to be quite thickly primed. So, understanding where our, we'll put our buildings back here. That's going to go there. And that's going to go there, being the most important aspects. There we go. Now we can figure out where some of these dirt areas here will be mixes of like grass and sort of dying earth. So where it's just earth, I want to make sure, same back here on this hill, we want to make sure we add some interesting texture. So we're going to lay down just a little bit of that mixture. We just kind of slop it on here. Not knowing exactly what I want to do with the graveyard yet. I'm not sure how many big buildings or whatever I want to have in there. So um, we just want to make sure the pattern is fairly random. Like we don't want to just do four little spots. You want to have things that kind of connect, some things that run up to the edge and so on. Here we'll put some next to the, like next to the path where maybe the grass has gotten kind of stomped down as people walk on it. Again, just think of the narrative of like, what would happen? Why would this not be growing? Maybe here, next to the building here, this would be kind of some dead earth because it's being covered by the sun, right? Like the house is blocking the sunlight. So that's going to be dead. So then what we're going to do once we lay that down is we grab a little bit of our uh, thick, large, like our large grit. We just kind of sprinkle that over the areas. We don't do a lot. This is just to lay down some interesting texture here and there. Okay. And we grab our medium grit and we go a little higher. Here's where we want a little more because we want the medium grit to be the majority of the sort of texture. In other words, we want a few large rocks mixed in and some small sand, but the majority of it is broken up by being the sort of medium grain texture. And by using a spread like this of three, what you see is you get a lot better, uh, you get a lot better coverage overall. Then we take our sand, and we just kind of sprinkle that over that area. Basically, just think like you're a chef and you're just putting some, some salt and pepper into your dish. That's basically what you're going for. Okay. All right. So I'm going to continue on here. Just keep texturing this up. I might pick a few spaces like on the road. Maybe there'll be some some areas of, of uh, texture where the cobblestones have been broken up or something like that. This city is supposed to be, you know, have been working up until recently when Slanesh came in and basically took it over. So it's now, you know, in disrepair. But up until recently, it was a functional city. So we don't want to make it a complete wasteland, right? Um, but basically by mixing this in, we can start to show how it's falling apart. So I'm gonna continue on here, and then when I come back, we're gonna talk about, before we go and prime it, what we do with these edges, okay? 
So that's where we'll come back next. All right, so we're back. Everything is dry over here. All right, so we've got all the grit and stuff attached. And our bricks are set up, our cobblestone's all dry, we've got our sand, we've got the graveyard completed, so we've got some tombstones and such. Uh, so everything's basically at that at this level is ready to go. So we're gonna wanna pretty soon here, we might you know make a few other small additions, but we're gonna want to get this ready to prime. So a couple notes when you're thinking about using this foam. The first thing is don't leave your your sides empty, right? That is to say, don't leave these as exposed pink foam. It's nothing that's generally gonna matter too much, it just doesn't look good. <laughs> so, and unfortunately the way these are cut, they're never exactly the same size. So even though they're all supposed to be like two foot by two foot, in general they're not actually like machine precision cut to two feet by two feet. So you'll often get little areas like this where there's you know a good 16th of an inch difference. If you have a hot wire cutter, you can remove this a lot easier. However, I don't. So instead we have a one of these knives, which is uh, made of, I don't know, something that's not metal. But the point is any really super sharp knife, this is like a porcelain knife or something, it cuts this stuff really well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in here, we put our blade flat against the top part, and then we're just gonna push right through. And the key is we want to always make sure that the blade is running flat against the top area. And we just work our way along. Now we have a nice, smooth, even side, or at least smooth enough for our purposes. So, once that's done, then we need to get this flattened out and ready to paint. So, I'm gonna push that back to there a little bit, and we go back to what we had before, which is our DAP patch and paint. So, looks like that. It's like drywall paste, pretty standard stuff. And we get out a nice flat tool, get in there, right? So we got a little bit of goopy goop. By the way, have something on the floor so you're not driving, you know, dropping this stuff on whatever your floor is. Get that right on there and then smooth it out. That's basically all there is to it. You just kind of work your way along and you can see what you'll get is basically a nice smooth covered layer. Now sometimes you might have little pieces like that. Just apply a little extra and then flatten it out. So, now I've got to work my way all the way around this bad boy, puttying it all out. And this will also help us later to have this styrofoam covered because when we prime this, we're gonna prime it with a rattle can. And this kind of MDF foam is more resistant to the aerosol that's in the rattle can, but it will still get attacked by it a little. But if we have everything covered, basically, if there's no actual sort of styrofoam exposed, then we don't hurt anything. If you have some exposed styrofoam and you need to rattle can prime, a fun trick is to just take a little varnish that is not aerosol based, so like through your airbrush or something, or even just brush it on, and give a coat of that, and then you can prime over it, and that'll protect it. So, there you go. That's just, I'm gonna putty around the side, might do a few little final touch-ups, and then we're ready to start priming and painting. So, uh, when we come back, we'll talk about that. All right, so I apologize for this part being much <laughs> more poorly filmed, but I'm out on my back porch, and uh, this is the method I have to film out here. So, everything's ready to prime. It's a nice, beautiful, sunny, low humidity day. 
and uh, I just want to take a moment here. So first of all, with any buildings or anything like that, if you've got a separate thing, prime it separate. Don't have it over here on the actual board. Secondly, after we puttied the side of the board here, we sanded it down. So I took a mix of uh, 80 first and then 200 grit sandpaper and sanded everything down so we got a nice smooth finish. So now everything else you see here is attached to the actual board and like I say glued down. You'll notice that the edges of the buildings are marked with the little things. Those do play double duty, those little like crates and bags and stuff. One, they tell me exactly where the buildings go. And two, they provide a little more visual interest. Uh, you know, one thing of note here, if you're building like a cityscape, this is rather specific. Um, but in general, little details on your boards matter, right? So uh, when you can add little elements of visual interest, like the little brick path, or you see that little like crate or the little step coming out the back or this stuff down here, it's generally a good idea to do so because it just adds little things to discover and it doesn't really take away from your ability to put figs on the table. So now what we do is we go to some good old fashioned primer here. This is Rust-Oleum Ultra Cover Paint and Primer, Flat Black, that kind of thing. We also have some lighter colors. So this is Granite, it's like a gray. And this is Fossil, I guess. I don't know, whatever, this color. It's a lighter color. The point is, is that just like normal, even with our rattle cans, we're still gonna zenithal. So, now I'm gonna get to work priming all this and it's a lot of spray paint. So, with next time you see this, we'll be back on the normal camera and uh, we'll talk about some painting and how we finish her up. All right, so as you can see, we've made a lot of progress since the last time, but this is mainly just painting. Once everything was, you know, sort of done and sealed, I just painted it. Um, I didn't really record much for this because there wasn't anything special about this part. If you've watched any basing video I've ever done, then you're familiar with the methods I use to paint it. So, you know, we have, we're just laying down a brown color, we're using dry brushing, we're using washing on the dirt. All the cobblestones were done in the same way as my cobblestone basing video, uh, which I'll link below. Um, the red bricks were again just laying down a nice red earth color and then stippling some colors in, dry brushing, and then putting a glaze over top. Uh, the various stones were done in different colors, uh, just as per the realistic uh, stone video, just matched two colors that were appropriate here. Uh, the wood was done with uh, Scale 75 Ink Intensity Intense Wood and then washed and dry brushed with, or dry brushed with a lighter gray and then washed again and then dry brushed again. So in other words, you should notice that most of this is just done, I mean, these cobblestones took forever, I'm not gonna lie, this is like a really lengthy process because every single stone had to be done individually. So I had to paint each stone like basically four times. So that was not fun. But that being said, it's done now, so yay. Um, the rusting over here, the metal grates, that was done as per my uh, rusting and weathering tutorial. Uh, and the bone, you can't see much of it, but there are some, uh, let's see if we can turn it around here. There are like some, some skulls and stuff in here because it's, you know, it's a GW piece of terrain, so of course there's skulls. Uh, so all those were done as per the realistic bone video. Basically, I just followed all the normal tactics that I do for this stuff. And at this point, it's more or less ready for our next steps. So I'm gonna finish some very final painting. I just wanted to give you an image of it of where I'm taking it before we go to finishing. Because obviously I don't have the buildings on right now, but you can see where there are holes marked for them. Um, what I wanna do as my next step is a couple different elements, one of which is placing things like flock and static grass and tufts. So I'm gonna talk about the tactics that we use with those, especially on display boards to make them look good. Uh, I'm also going to then do the realistic water here poured in the canals. Uh, I, one, of the, one of the quick things I wanted to say about that before, we, before I poured anything is here in the canals, I wanna make sure I stay in the light here. You know, where I cut this away, there's a join between this layer 
like this top of the, of the original MDF and the lower one. So I glued all around there and, and dropped a bunch of glue down inside, but there can still be a gap there. So what I did is you can see how this is kind of white in some places. What I did is I actually took some varnish, like just some, uh, basically a bottle of, uh, of cheap varnish, and I just laid it all the way around the edge, just straight out of the bottle, just glooped it in there, nice and thick. So it soaks in and seals up that crevice, right? Just to make sure that there's nothing. So when I do pour the water, this is a this is an area that's a, that's actually sealed. Uh, obviously, we'll have to seal off the end uh, when we do the actual pour, but we'll get to that uh, in a later part. So with this being said, it's basically ready to go for our uh, for our next steps. So. Uh, I'm going to pause here for a moment, uh, and then we're going to move on to tufts and grass. So back in just a moment. All right, so we're back. Everything's painted. Now I've placed the buildings on here so that I know where they are for what I'm about to do, because I don't want to accidentally put sort of grass or something where I've got, you know, other things uh, already set up. So first thing I did is we have a little cup here of some PVA glue and water and a big brush that I don't mind ruining. Okay. And then we have all sorts of stuff. We've got dark grass. We've got light grass and we'll mix those together to get some grass. We've got tufts and tufts. We've got little mossy tufts. We've got little traditional tufts. Uh, we've got some leaves, some vines, some dead vines, which we're going to use on the stone thing over there. We've got some flowers because we're going to make little flower gardens for these buildings. We've got these bigger, mossier tufts, which are really cool. A lot of the stuff's from Gamers Grass. I've done a review on them. They're really good. Uh, we've got some brighter colored, sort of uh, more green tufts. Moss, always useful. Moss grows in lots of places. Bright flowers, again, for said flower beds. Darker moss for darker things. And then we've got some blue grass, like, I mean, blue, 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 because this is supposed to be a chaos board. And so we're gonna do some fun things by having some things start to look a little alien. Okay, we'll leave the tufts to the side for the moment because we are gonna start, my working space here is an absolute mess. You can't see it right off camera, but trust me, it is a nightmare. We're gonna start with our static grass. So this darker grass mix is from uh, Gale Force 9. Set that right there. Our lighter gra grass mix is from Foreground. Uh, I don't really care, you know, as long as they don't look totally cheap and fake, they're generally fine with me. Um, we're actually not going to, one of the real keys with static grass is we paint it. So we're not just gonna put this on straight. So it doesn't really super matter the color. We want it to be kind of general and a little mixed up, but I'm not super concerned about the final color. Um, one of the other elements, obviously the right way to do this is with a little static applicator that makes the grass stand up. If you're like me and don't have money for static applicators and don't have those sorts of things, uh, I'm going to show you the way that I do it to try to make sure that you still end up with some tall springy grass. So knowing that the house is here, thinking about like where people would walk, I know I'm going to want to make this area right next to the house over here a little, uh, I know I'm barely on camera there, uh, a little garden. So we're going to put some grass out here in this area and up here. We don't want it to be, I don't want this to be grassy yards. I want it to be patchy because again, the city's gone and is going to ruin. So what we do is we get our brush and we just stipple out some of our glue water mixture. Let's put a little back here. Okay, cool. Then I've got some just tweezers and I'm gonna take a little bit of my dark grass here, kind of mix it up, make sure it's nice and fluffy. Fluffy. And then I just start 
basically just tapping. And by tapping, we hopefully get it to be a little more upstanding. Let's take a little bit of the, let's get some of our brighter grass here. The nice part is it doesn't matter if you kind of get some of this on the board. You can just, you know, once it dries, you can just blow it off. So again, we just tap, tap, tap. Tappy, tappy, tappy. Go back to our darker mix. Get some more of that in that area. Get some of our lighter mix here. Always going to put more on than we need and then we'll just pull their excess back off and that's fine we're also going to varnish it all down at the end to make sure that it all sticks and stays okay so what we get is a nice little mixture of grass like that and like i said we're going to paint it we're going to varnish it so we're not stopping there okay so that's how we do that kind of stuff and i'm not going to do all the grass i'm going to kind of fly through a bunch of different ones here to show you basically what i'm on about so, once you have all your grass, the next step is we're going to want to put down our tufts. Now, for tufts, I just use good old fashioned Zappa Gap super glue. So, get our super glue ready here. And we're going to do a little flower garden kind of right over here, put a couple out here. Basically, you know, this, this house was someplace where somebody lived and, you know, kept a little garden. And, uh, and kept stuff out front. So we get out our little grass tufts here, or flowers. It's the same techniques for tufts or flowers. So we got a couple different colors. We got white, we've got purple, and red, and yellow. So when you're doing a big display board, I often try to think about what the army looks like and its color palette and kind of match it to that. So specifically what I'm going to look at is I'm going to set yellow to the side. That's a little too bright. But I have a lot of reds and purples and whites in my army. So let's mix some of that in. So what we do is we're going to just go ahead and lay down some drops of super glue. Right over here. And by the way, we can lay some of it like on top of the grass. Layering this stuff is actually a really nice trick to kind of sell the, the depth of it. Because often there'll be nature that kind of gets in each other's stuff. And that's fine. Okay, then we take our tweezers and we're going to go ahead and pull off a tuft. And then we find a spot where it looks nice. And we go ahead and we lay that up in there. And then flip those tweezers over so you got the pointy ends or whatever, you know, like this is a little L shaped one. If yours is just a standard tweezers, just make sure you come in with just the points. Push it down, make sure it's nice and attached, and you're good. Then we keep, we grab another tuft of that color. We wanna make sure these are nice and mixed up. We don't want a lot of them right next to each other of the same color. You know, this person had a fairly interesting garden where they put lots of different tufts, or lots of, they didn't plant tufts, obviously, or dur, where they put lots of different flowers. So we just keep dropping them around here, pushing them down, make sure they look real nice. Let's get another purple one like right there. That'd be a nice place. You just kind of want to make it a little random, but just spice them around to your heart's content. Let's get some of this like super bright red I really like how this looks. Again, all these are gonna get a little bit of paint, so we'll change the color a little bit. Or at the very least, they're gonna get some varnish and stuff like that, but we'll, we'll get to that stage once I have everything done. But you can see how much brighter those are. Look at how that just 
perks that right up. Here, let me. Okay. There we go. Okay, let's grab another tuft here. A lot of tufts say like that they're self-adhering, like meaning that you wouldn't need to technically use glue. Um, I don't believe that. <laughs> they're like, yeah, they're a little sticky, but the difference between, you know, a little sticky and going to stay on a display board as it gets transported around at tournaments and in the car and every other ridiculous thing, well, those are often two separate worlds. So. A little bit of um, a little bit of extra glue will do you. Now let's take some white flowers. These are nice and neutral, kind of cool everything off, balance it all out. Drop that in there. Let's see. How about like right down in there? There we go. Break that up a little. And I'm just picking off the tufts I like that I think look cool. And if you got a little bit of extra glue or something, don't worry, because we'll varnish over all of it. And when we do, that'll all all the shiny glue will go away. It'll just become invisible. And there we go. Now we got a nice little flower bed around the cottage. Easy peasy. So when we talk about stuff like moss, the key with all of these is you want to put them where you think they're going to belong. So like the moss I'm going to lay here in like the canal bed. I'll have some moss growing along the top here, right? Or where there would be water or along the sides and under here down in that. Sorry, let me move this here, like on the corner of this where where water would naturally gather and sort of run down here at the bottom. Think organically about where would these things grow? So like I have these little sort of bigger mossy tufts. These would grow in tough shady areas where there's not as much light to make something flower or grass, but you would get these thicker brush stuff. Um, so where there's still dirt and life, but not, you know, as it's more wet. So probably in here, like along the fence, you know, stuff like that. These also look really nice for a graveyard. So you can kind of mix and match and get all your stuff into a position where it feels like that's where it actually organically belongs. The more you place stuff like this in, in an area where it's going to like, when somebody just looks at your board and goes, oh yeah, sure, like this house had a flower bed and has a yard, right? The more you do that kind of stuff, the more it will ring true to your viewers. Okay, so I'm going to carry on. I got a lot more little tufts and grasses to lay down and uh, I'll be back and I'll talk about how we paint them back in just a moment. All right, so we have all of the grass and tufts aligned. I took the buildings back off because for this next part, I don't want to accidentally be painting the buildings. So you can see like how we've got tufts. You can see where we fit in some... Uh, you know, sort of more mossy stuff over here in the graveyard. Uh, we've got tufts and things down in here. So you can see how that looks with some tufts and some blue down there. Though That blue will look cool in the water. I like the idea that the sort of chaos infection kind of came in through the water. Um, but a lot of these just look very flat, right? Like if we look at this stuff in here, like these, they're just very flat. Um, same with like the blue tufts. They're cool, I like the color. But there's just not a lot going on. So fortunately, we can fix that. Uh, and we always paint our tufts and our grass and everything like that because unpainted elements always look very false when put next to a bunch of stuff that's been painted. So even just applying a simple wash or a dry brush makes a really big difference. Uh, so we're gonna take ourselves a little dry brush here. In this case, I'm gonna use a flat one instead of a makeup brush. 
Got a little uh, little ivory over here on the on the palette out of camera. I'm just using uh, Pro Acryl Ivory. And we're not going to wipe that much off. Like often with dry brushing, you really want to get you know most of the paint off the brush. Here, I still want a lot because what we're going to do is we're going to come in and we're just going to go ahead and give a nice light dry brush over all this stuff. And you can see, I don't know if that's going to pick up on camera or not, but it's very much, it's very strong in reality. You can see how just instantly this stuff gets more visually interesting because you get a little bit of light filtering through on the tufts. It just makes everything look a lot more compelling. So again, we'll get all these down here, and so on. Just quick touches, quick touches. You know, just kind of catching that stuff. If you want some of them, like maybe I want these blue ones to really pop out because they're kind of weird. So we'll kind of get those a little more pure white. And now all of a sudden there's a transition there. We have some contrast on these tufts, just like everything else. Now with the flowers, it's a little different story because with the flowers, uh, with these guys, you know, they're already colored. We don't just want to run a bunch of white right over the top, apropos of nothing, okay? Um, so instead, with them, what we can do is kind of go the opposite direction. We'll show you that in a second. The other thing you can do if you want is you can add some color variation. So I've also got a little yellow ochre over here on my palette. So I'm just kind of mixing that in. This is some, uh, again, yellow ochre from War Color, or sorry, from Pro Acryl. And wipe a little bit of that. And so if we want to bring in a little color, we can just kind of splash that around. And now we get a slightly warmer effect on some of the grasses where maybe it's sunlight or something like that. Again, this takes a few seconds, but it can make a big difference. Uh, as a side note, it will also tend to make your tufts a little tougher. Ah, uh, tufter. Stay for the puns, folks. Um, because that paint is going to sit there and harden up and basically uh, solidify around these things and make them a little more resistant. Not incredibly so. But a little bit and every little bit helps okay all right so then the other direction we can go is we can grab ourselves something like an Athonian camo shade or an agrax earth shade uh, we'll start with the agrax and what we're going to do is we're going to grab a nice big brush we're just going to get right down in there okay and then in some of these tufts, we're just going to come in and around the base, kind of down in the heart of it, and around it. By the way, make sure the glue is dry before you do this, because otherwise you will ruin even your junky brush. But what we do here is we just kind of, as you can see, I'm just shoving it down in the heart and then kind of spreading it around, around a little bit. By doing that, what happens is some of the same mud color from the ground, like around the plant, ends up on the ground and the plant. It visually ties the two elements together, which makes the thing, again, feel more like it's actually part of the world. Um, because then it doesn't feel, if you've ever looked at a mat or something, or a gaming base or whatever, and you saw a tuft and you went, oh, that's a tuft, and it just felt so tufty right out of the gate, that's often because there's no reason, it's just it's just sitting there. It's obvious it's just sitting there. It's not connected to the world. It's not painted in any way. There's nothing to make you think it's actually part of it. By doing this and getting some darkness at the heart of the, the tuft, not only do we create more contrast, which again, one of the reasons these often feel out of scale when people just put blank tufts on is because they, they have almost no contrast. And if your paint job has contrast, like even if you've just washed and dry brushed you established a bunch of contrast and then you have your your all your tufts just being basically blank slates then 
it's just not going to fit. It's not going to look appropriate. So by shoving a little wash down inside and on the ground around it, you tie everything together, you increase your contrast, and you make it feel more like a, a part of the world. Uh, it also just looks pretty cool. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a winner on all fronts, right? Okay. All right. Drop a little bit in the center of each of those. There we go. Okay. Cool. Uh, get a little right there and then we're good. All right. So, now, for the flowers, what can often be a good thing to do is you take your Ethonian camo shade. Since often your tufts are going to be in the green tone already, getting a little bit more green tone into the, t into the flowers can be very helpful. So you just kind of come in the middle around this and you just kind of shove a little bit of it down in there. And what this does is it gives a more natural tone off into this stuff. Now, I'm being a bit uh, alien with this intentionally. I'm having brighter color flowers than I might otherwise, so I'm not going to go over the top here, but it still helps. Just that little bit of painted elements creates some more variation and just adds some more visual interest to these guys. Makes them feel more a uh, part of the world, which is what we ultimately want for all the reasons I just described. Okay. You can also kind of just stipple it around on the area near that, and it may, uh, that little green tone will make stuff feel like there's maybe some moss or some organic matter or something like that in that area. All right, great. So, now the next thing we gotta handle is the grass itself. So, with the, the grasses itself here, uh, these colors are, you know, they're bright. Like, frankly, too bright. So to that, we're gonna get out our friendly airbrush. Okay? And <clears throat> what we're gonna do is we're gonna take control of uh, of this grass and make it a little more visually interesting. So, once again, we're going to add some color. So I'm going to go about eight drops of thinner here, okay, to about one drop of Dollar Rowney FW Sepia ink. Okay? So, this will be a very light tint. We just backfill it there. Let's test on the back of our hand. You can see that's what that looks like. In fact, we're gonna go a little stronger. Seeing how strong that is, let's go a little stronger. We'll take, we'll put a second drop in there. So we'll call it four to one instead of eight to one. There we go, okay. All right, then we come into the grass and we're just going to add some brown patches. Over top of the two that I already did. I'll go out onto the dirt every so often. So I'm not going to try to just hit the grass. So again, just like with the tufts. When I'm running a shade over the top and it's going between the two, it's going to make it feel more real because all of a sudden, there are elements connecting these two things. It's the smallest little visual signifier, but believe me when I say it makes a huge difference. Also, these brown tones will just really nicely tone back grasses. A lot of times, especially, these grasses, they just kind of feel a little too bright, like a little too spring day. It's a bit nonsensical. And again, it's a little bit of paint sitting on top of it, so it will also help it feel... Uh, it'll also help it stick. We'll varnish at the end too, which will help with that more. Again, if you use multiple types of grass like I do, this is effectively a glaze to help bring them together. Okay, all right, 
cool. So now the grass looks a little more, uh, a little more subdued, but we can still do some more. So now what we're gonna do is once again, I'm gonna go heavy into that thinner. We're gonna go about 10 drops of thinner in. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some straight white ink, okay? One drop of straight white. I'm gonna grab a little bit of that yellow ochre paint that I had already. Okay, just take that right off my palette, work that down in there. And what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and mix that all up. So I get this creamy egg color, right? And we'll give that a test on the back of the hand. That's about how much that covers, right? So that looks good. Okay, then what I wanna do is come in and on the grass, just create some nice highlights. And I'm gonna go ahead and just rock the brush at an angle. I can get some of these flowers too while we're at it. Just trying to create some little points where sunlight is catching things and creating the little hint of sort of yellow white light. If you've ever you know, sort of just spent a lot of time looking at the sun, you know that like, or sorry, not looking at the sun. Please don't spend a lot of time looking at the sun. If you ever spent a lot of time just sitting out on a nice sunny day, looking at grass or your yard or something, you know that grass is like, you know, it has a bit of a satin sheen to it. It can shine a little. So adding these little hot spots here are a good way to sort of capture that sun filtering through and being uh, being captured by occasional reflective or wet pieces of grass or something like that. Yet again, it toughens it up. Yet again, it brings your different colors of grass together. Yet again, it creates more contrast and visual interest. I hope at this point you're catching on, folks. Okay. And again, I'm trying to keep the brush at a low angle, right? Like really making sure that it's it's hitting the, the, the grasses like this. So that way, I'm only getting the tops, trying to be aware of what I'm shooting from behind. You know, we can go around a few times until we like where we're at. And brighten up some of those flowers a little bit. Let's get some real bright things here since this is going to be underwater. All right, and there we go. Now we've got some painted elements. Uh, so the final thing I'm gonna do here is uh, just go ahead and varnish all of this. Uh, just make sure everything, all my tough supplied, all my paints, everything is stuck down and nice and dry. All my little glue spots are covered up. So to do that, I'm gonna let all this dry for a minute. Then I'm just gonna varnish the whole thing with my airbrush. Uh, of course, we're gonna use our AK Interactive Ultra Matte Varnish and give it a nice good spray. And uh, then we'll do the water effects and we're done. All right, back in just a moment. All right, and so now finally we've come to the end of the road here of our board. Everything is together. The resin is poured here, and I want to talk for a moment about pouring resin. Uh, so I'm actually going to scoop this a little bit there to be in frame. A little better. So whenever you're pouring resin like I did over here on this side, okay, uh, you need to tape it. So for that, we use our best friend blue tape. You need to have something flat 
In this case, I used a little display plinth. So there's a flat piece of wood to sit up against it. And you need to have a lot of pressure against it. So you can see, we spin this around. Okay. So there's my tape. Peel it away. And it pulled some of the paint off or whatever, but that doesn't matter, that's fine. Okay. So, and now we've got a nice solid resin pour. Uh, one thing I will say, when I first did this, this side leaked. And it leaked because I didn't attach it tightly enough. The best way to do this is to go get one of those clamps, like a, a clamp from the hardware store where you can dual clamp both sides and then sort of tighten it up. That will really make sure that nothing leaks. I don't have that, so instead I just used a piece of wood and then a bunch of really heavy books. Uh, specifically, I found a use for all of my end times books because uh, these things weigh like a million pounds altogether. And the other side that worked fine, the close side, it did not. Um, so the really it just comes down to this point to finishing. Uh, whenever you pour resin, you want to make sure like in a big board like this that you have it lifted. This is a mistake I made and ended up needing to actually pry the board off of this table, which was hilarious. Like just even if you put it on four bottle caps, for example, that way if something leaks, it just runs down here on the surface and not doesn't stick to your board. So that was just a dumb, dumb move on me by being too, I was just be trying to be too quick. The other thing you want to do is you can smooth this stuff out. So you can see how your ends, like up there, it's nice and clear, right? But let's turn it around to this side. You can see how it's kind of foggy and uneven, right? Right there. Okay. I don't know if that's actually showing or not. It's kind of kind of dim, but I assume it's showing. So what we want to do, what we want to do in that case is we get out our very high grit sandpaper. Uh, by high grit, I mean low grit. I don't know. It's 800, folks. Okay, so you get out some 800 sandpaper. I get this from the auto body store. So nice piece of 800 sand grit. And then we're going to come in and we're just gonna smooth that down. Okay. And what that'll do is that'll allow us, it's gonna scratch it up. Don't worry about it, it's fine. Okay. Because you want it to be nice and flush. Same thing, you can start a little lower, honestly, like you can start at like 400 if it's already, if you've got a, a lot more, if you're doing like a display base or something, work your way up to 800 or 1,000. Okay. Now it's nice and smooth. Once it's nice and smooth, we can do a little wet sanding as well, whatever you want. But once it's nice and smooth, we just give it a nice wipe there to get all our dust off. And then if you need to smooth it back out, like if you've left some, uh, some scratches or anything like that because of your sandpaper, that is just a simple matter of your old friend gloss varnish. So we take a little gloss varnish actually put it on the back of my hand here. And gloss varnish is like your stand-in for your water effect. So once you know you've got it all wiped away, everything like that, you got no dust, you can just come in and give that a nice coat. And you can see how that fogginess just goes away. And what you get is a much smoother vision. Like I can see those rocks nice and clear now under there. 
and you're good to go. Okay? So, that's basically all there is to it. At this point, uh, obviously I'm going to repaint the side, so I'll redo all this with some heavy black paint, some craft paint, just to make it nice and tough. Uh, I'll probably add a few other little details, like some blood stains or something like that, around. But basically, that's it. That's the display board done and in the books. Whoa, what a long road this was. At any rate, if you happen to stick with me through this entire thing, first off, amazing. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Uh, but uh, I hope this is useful to you. I know this was uh, a very particular project of mine, but at the same time, I hope some of the tips and tricks and thoughts will be useful to you in your own uh, display board making. Uh, at any rate, if you liked this, give it a like. Uh, subscribe for additional hobby cheating. We have new videos here every Saturday. If there's something you'd like to see me cover, uh, feel free to drop that down in the comments. If you have questions about this project, again, drop those down there. Always happy to help. Uh, but as always, I very much appreciate you watching this one, and we'll see you next time.